theme of the week this week is um, entrepreneurship. So great to be joined by the big man, Oli Cohn, uh, Quinn's club legend, 149 caps of Quinn's, one cap for Wales, won a Six Nations medal that season as well. Um, and myself and Oli really bonded on a trip to Bermuda about two years ago. Um, so that was good. Uh, he retired in 2013. And in 2008, whilst he was still playing, he set up the Jolly Hog, which you all know. Uh, he set that up with his two brothers, so three of them all together. And four parts of the business, I think, Ollie, which I'll ask you on later, but, you know, yep. there's the event side, the restaurant side, the kiosk side, and the retail side. Um, so, yeah, just before we start, lads, feel free, if you want to put your videos on, please do. If you don't, that's fine. Um, and just keep, keep on mute. If you want to come in at any point with a question, please, please do. Uh, otherwise, just ask a quick, Ollie will ask, answer any questions at the end. Uh, but yeah, I suppose just to recap, the idea of the session is just to give a bit of an insight into different um, industries or sectors. Um, last week, property development. This week, entrepreneurship. Le next week, hopefully, we're going to have Mel Dean and Ben Gotting on talking about personal training. But the idea is, as I said, give you some insight, maybe help you, inspire you, give you a bit of advice going forward. Uh, in terms of what you could be doing while you're playing. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to be talking to Ollie about how he's found transition, his journey so far, what he did whilst he was playing, any advice and answer any questions. So 30, 40 minutes max, lads. So, uh, Ollie, we'll get started because obviously we want to hear from Ollie. So, Ollie, thanks so much for joining and giving us your time. Um, how are you doing, mate? How's lockdown and uh, how's everything going? Well, it's been a bit of a bonkers time, but I guess it's the same for everyone. Um, we've seen a lot of change. Um, yeah. and it, at this time, you know, probably one of the biggest things is because we've got four different channels, we're selling pork or food through, um, yeah. one of the biggest lessons, and we can go back into it a bit more, but one of the biggest lessons is having these four channels has basically saved our business. Um, oh. is, uh, we're sat here now trying to predict when the hospitality industry is going to open up and, and if it does in the next couple of weeks, it's going to look very different, but. Yeah, I mean, o overall, um, I think uh, it's been quite good. Um, if, if I'm being totally honest, I think what it's made us this period as, as a business and as a family is um, really uh, focusing on what's important um, yeah. for us as a family and for, as a business. And um, it's been really good for, for making sure we know what's important for us. So, yeah, overall, all right. I've put on a bit of timber. Um, mm -hmm. getting a bit fat but I need to you know I can sort that out it's not a problem yeah and and you retired mate you retired as we said in 2013 just uh you know what just just give us your view of how you found transition in terms of you know what did you think transition looked like as a player and then you know I suppose looking back now you've been out of the game seven years what kind of you know what what kind of picture do you see now what advice would you give to the players I guess for, from from my point of view like I um, I started thinking about it really early um, and that would be my biggest, biggest thing is just think about things early. Um, and we started in 2008 and just to give you an overview of the, our kind of story and where we started, it, it literally started, and I don't know how much you guys know, but it started with my wife buying me a sausage making machine um, for my birthday. And it was an, a really small attachment for a Kenwood chef. And when I started making sausages, I'd snap my ACL for the second time and you guys know how long it takes to get back from some of these things. So I was out and I was so heavy, that it took me like a year to get back from an ACL. So I, I started making sausages um, from that point on, I, I became completely obsessed and it was my passion, it was my thing to um, make sausages and cure bacon. And so I went, um, I, I'd go to Smithfields um, and pick up the, the pork uh, and then cover, cover this really small flat in pork um, and fat and intestines and um, but I just absolutely loved it and I learned I'm, I'm quite dyslexic so I learned through YouTube um, and then became friendly um, with a family friend of ours um, who had a butchery and he gave me a butcher's block in the corner of, of his butchery um, and, a, and a bigger machine and so I started making bigger batches trialing them out on the lads uh, and then eventually um, thought I oh, will I'll get my brother involved Josh um, and that's so Josh and Ollie Jolly is where the name Jolly Hog came from um, and so Josh was a carpenter with my dad and I said look Jack in being a carpenter and come and 
come and join us uh, and, and chase the sausage dream with me. And, 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 and that's where it really started. And it, it literally started from, um, I'd, love to, I'd love to say we had this amazing business plan at the start, but we really didn't. It was just purely from a passion for making really sausages. And, and not to say we didn't make some bad ones because we did, we made sausages at the start and some terrible recipes, but we eventually got some recipes we really liked. And then we put up a pop-up gazebo on, um, it was like, uh, I think it was one of the Autumn Internationals in November at Twickenham on the corner of the car park of, of the stoop. And it was literally my mum, me, Josh, uh, and our cousin on a barbecue. We made the sausages on the Thursday and we sold them on the Saturday. And we, 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 we walked away with 500 quid in our back pocket and we thought, we, we literally thought we were millionaires. And, um, and, then, um, and then me and Josh realized when we did the spreadsheet that it cost us about 800 quid to be there. Um, and so we had no kind of business acumen at all, but we realized that we yeah. loved what we did. And so eventually we got Max on board, um, uh, who's my middle brother. So there's three brothers, me, Max and Josh. And, and Max had a bit, bit more business uh, now about him. I was obviously, obviously still playing rugby at the time. And, um, uh, and I was literally, so I'd be like cutting onions at five in the morning and putting a hog roast on and then walking 100 yards into the changing room and playing against Bath. I don't reckon you'd be able to do it nowadays, but it was kind of how we started the business um, through quite a lot of graft. And, you know, anyone that's thinking about getting into um, event catering is it's great, it's good fun, but it is proper hard graft, which I'm sure you're all used to anyway. Um, so that's kind of where the business started. Um, and um, we've now got to a position where we've got four businesses within the Jolly Hog Group. So it started off at a street food level. Um, doing events and we had central contracts in our concessions business with Hyde Park Winter Wonderland and, and different street food events and stadia um, and then uh, and then we had this um, dream that we wanted to develop a retail brand um, and we wanted to get into retailers and we were you know going to launch into all of them and um, and we've got, now got a retail business um, which is packs of sausages and bacon um, pulled pork and scotch eggs that are in a retail format that customers can buy in the big multiples and then and uh, uh, so we, we start, set up the retail business off the back of the concessions and then after that open up some restaurants which again you know more than happy to kind of talk to you about the ups and downs we've had over the last four years with restaurants um we we ended up with two we sold one of them we've now got one um and that's called pigsty and that's been a lot of fun uh, and great in lots of different ways because it enables us to um, do lots of new product development and it keeps us on trend with what's happening in the casual dining market. Um, that's mothballed at the moment. Um, and, then, um, and then we've got um, our kiosk business, um, which we opened a, a kiosk, which was called Jolly Hog on the Trot. Um, and that is um, really good bacon sandwiches and really good coffee and sausage rolls. A really simple concept. We worked with Network Rail on it. We've got one. Um, but the idea was to roll that out as a franchise <clears throat> and that was pre pre corona so we, we basically went from um, fat lad at Quinn's with a sausage machine um, who loved sausages and curing bacon to where we are now um, um, with with four businesses underneath the group um, and three of the business three of the businesses are, are in hibernation and one of them um, is smashing it in retail because um, fortunately for us, um, n no one's eating in pubs and restaurants, but lots of people are eating at home. Um, and so that channel of retail, and this is what um, lots of people might advise about being really good at one thing, which I get. But what we did is have a number of different channels uh, and different businesses, which has meant that if three get put into hibernation and one smashes it, we're okay. Um, and, and, and that's been that's saved our business at this time in a, in a critical time. Um, but yeah, retail is, is very interesting and in massive growth for us. Uh, and there's there's lots happening on that front. So you, that's kind of an overview of the business. Do you, do you mean that in terms of kind of spreading your risk? I suppose having the four channels is probably a, have you, have you kind of learned during this period that that's kind of possibly the way to go forward. Have you know spread the risk? So if one area is not doing so well, you've got other areas that can really really flourish yeah 100 percent, and that goes for you know i remember the day um so I, I retired seven years ago uh in june and then we won the contract to do all the catering at the stoop 
and retired in June uh, through shoulder injury. And then in September, I was frying chips and sausages. And I could see the pitch. I was 10 yards away from it. And I think I was just thinking, yeah. it's horrific. Yeah. But what ended up happening is all of our revenue for the business in year one or two, when we started to kickstart things, was all around Quinn's. Uh, yeah. And it was really dangerous. Like 90% of all of our work was Quinn's. And so we had a plan to then divvy it up and go, right, we need to go and get other contracts to make sure that if Quinn's falls over, we've got other things. And, and now we've got, you know, retail is a small percentage, uh, sorry, concessions is a small percentage of the overall group. So to spread the mm-hmm. grid across the different channels is, is definitely a good idea and different customers. So um, the next channel that we're looking at um, seriously, and we're, we're a little bit behind the curve because a lot of people are doing it, is direct to consumer. So how do we cut out, if any of you guys are thinking about food, what the really good direct-to-consumer businesses are out there that are smashing it, um, that might have a long-life product that people could subscribe to? Um, you know, how could that work in bacon? How can that work in sausage? Can you get a, a regular delivery through your door from us? And so um, that's another channel we're looking at potentially. Yeah. And then, Ollie, just in terms of steps of setting up, you know, a lot of lads here have got different kind of business interests. I was chatting to a lad this morning who's a qualified electrician, but is possibly thinking of setting up his own uh, company. You know, what, what are the, in, in simple terms, what are the kind of advice in terms of simple steps for setting up a business, running on with a business idea? You know, is it a case of just backing yourself and learning as you go along? Or is there kind of simple advice you can get in terms of, you know, what, what is the best way to start? Well, I think pulling on as much resource you've got and really using the network is, is mega important. And the RPA, actually, you, the guys on this call from the RPA wouldn't know, but they get, the RPA gave me a massive leg up um, in terms of an introduction for retail. Um, and that changed the course of our whole business. Um, I got invited. I, can't, I won't say the name of the person, but I got invited. I got a letter through saying, um, you're a VIP at the British Barbecue Championships. And I was like, Oh, happy days. That's, that is oh. fucking happy days. Um, and I went and then I realized who had invited me. Um, and then, you know, that was potentially one of the, the you know, biggest things that's happened in our roadmap. Um, but in terms of a step by step for me, I was never one to potentially have a really good strategic plan from the start. Um, at a ground level, I loved sausages and bacon and I wanted to sell as many as I could um, as fast as I could. Um, at, you know, at the best quality, and that was literally it. Um, and I, I don't think that's a bad way to start a business. Uh, you know, yeah. uh, sometimes being a bit naive about some of the costs, some of the work involved, isn't a bad thing because you work out. If you're young, you work out what works and what doesn't. And I think you know, you could you could sk- scare yourself to death writing billions of business plans. And I I, I would advise having a plan. But um, sometimes just the naivety of just jumping into something that you're really passionate about um, is key. And, you know, one of the biggest things I say to people is that just you need to feel passionate about it. Like we're all lucky as rugby players um, to do something we really enjoy. And that would be that would be key to life after rugby and that transition. And I've been lucky in the fact that I found something early, really, really enjoyed and I could get my teeth stuck into um, and I was lucky, you know, because I worked with my brothers. Um, so I, w- I was lucky in terms of what we all bring to the party. Um, and that helped us put a structure on it. I think in terms of step by step, I think using your network and, and it, it also if you can get a mentor who has been involved in business or an industry that you're interested in early, then that will really help you cut out some of the mistakes um that you might make along the way so you know within your network if you can go to the guys at the rpa and say look i'm I'm looking for a mentor that knows everything there is about the pizza industry or um the cured meat industry or whatever it is you decide to go into then um that would really help um in terms of uh, 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 avoiding mistakes yeah and then you, you mentioned passion there, having passion for what you do. So I kind of, I learned that myself and looking back now, you know, I went into a sales job. I've been retired three years, went into a sales job the first year, absolutely hated it. And I suppose it's kind of made me realize you've got to do something you love, something you're passionate about, something that excites you. 
um, because if you're not doing that, it just it's just it's pretty difficult to get up in the morning and be motivated. So uh, I know you set up the business in 2008. You retired in 2013. So I suppose those few years, whilst you're still playing and you took the plunge to set up the business, that gave you the traction to kind of be at a point where you said, look, I can choose to carry on playing or, you know, I've got the business to a, a certain point where I back myself that it's going to work going forward after rugby. Is that, yeah, would, would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, I thought I was um, in the best position I could be when, you know, when I came around from the operation and the doctor said to me, there's no way you're playing rugby again. You know, I can operate on this shoulder, but um, it's like rearranging deck chairs in the Titanic. And and he was like, and at that point, I was like, it doesn't matter because I've got Jolly Hog. But it was still, it was still tough. I still think even if yeah. you've got an option that you um, you think's really good in your setup, I think, still think psychologically that first nine, twelve months is 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 mental uh, when you finish. Um, yeah. I thought I'd done loads and I had a business and, you know, the boys used to take the piss out of me for being shameless in um, how I plugged the business uh, and in how I networked. You know, I did, I did more, th I did more than most in terms of networking. I did more than um, a lot of the lads did on box duty at, at the stoop after games. Um, the stoops obviously got a very good network. Um, but, you know, Mike Brown would come up to me after the game and go, mate, I really don't want to do my box. Um, do you want to come and do it with me? And I'd go and do it and he'd stand there really quiet. He's a bit of a social retard anyway, but I think like, you know, I was happy to kind of do that. And I think, yeah. you know, another bit of advice would be do more, put yourself outside of your comfort zone as much as possible. You're used to that anyway. Um, but on those days off when the lads are playing Call of Duty, Get, get yourself out there in industry. You know, I, I did a day at, um, uh, for Gordon Ramsay at Claridge's, uh, his, his uh, Michelin star kitchen. Um, and I, I, I didn't know whether this was something I wanted to do in terms of in, in that industry of food. Um, and I, after 12 hours of peeling blanched tomatoes from gazpacho soup, I, I just thought this is no way I want to go into fine dining. Um, yeah. Uh, but I had to do that day on a day when I was really tired between games to, to work that out. Um, um, and I always look back on it and I always go, thank God I did that um, because it kind of helped me narrow down um, what I do like within food. And, and for me, like talk about passion, I, I kind of always knew that um, I was going to have my own business because I, I knew I'd get loads of satisfaction out of that and I'd be passionate about it. And I always knew it was going to be in food because that was always my obsession. Um, and it's, it always will be. I've always been curious about it. So, um, yeah, I, pu I pushed myself into that direction. Yeah. And then in terms of kind of looking back now, what kind of pitfalls are that play? Like, obviously, setting up a business is, you know, there's a risk element to it. It's not always going to be successful. Sometimes it takes years and years before the business turns uh, to even make a profit. So... You know, just in terms of looking back now, um, you know, what, what would you perhaps have done differently? What, what are the pitfalls of trying to set up your own business? Um, any kind of advice you can give to the lads on, on kind of that aspect? Yeah. Um, oh, man, I've made so many mistakes. Like, I've made so many mistakes. So it took us a long time, you know, if you guys are working out, uh, you know, a street food concept that you want to trial, it took us a long time to work out what are good events and what are bad events, you know, like you can go to a lot of festivals and you can think that you've booked in a 10 amazing festivals. Um, yeah. You can, uh, I mean, and I'll continue to make mistakes, I'm sure, but it's, I guess it's, again, there's a rugby analogy. It's what you do next. It's how you move on. Like we plowed serious cash into a restaurant um, and I was, you know, is this, does this go out to everyone? This video was this. Mate, it's it's been recorded, so you've you've already sworn a couple of times. We'll have to take that out. Um, <laughs> I, I, but, uh, no, 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 no. It's fine, mate. We can edit it and uh, touch up fine. anything. Uh, no, so, but yeah. so we can send it out to the lads. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not asked. I mean, basically, you know, we we if you'd have asked me, and this is being totally honest, like it, you know, yeah. two three years ago, um, I thought the jolly the making of the Jolly Hog Group was. Um, growing a chain of pigsty restaurants. I thought we had a concept that could be rolled out, uh, cookie cutted and rolled out, and I was convinced of it to the point where we ploughed so much into it. Um, and 
we opened up a really nice restaurant, a second one off the back of the first one being good. Um, and I did this business plan that was like that. It was like a hockey stick. Uh, and you could just see, it just said like millions. Just went millions. Yeah. millions, millions. And, um, and like, we closed it. Like, we, we, after a year, we closed it. And I, 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 it's only now that I can sit down and smile about it um, and go, you know, that was, that was not great. And, and at the time, you know, the reason we did close it was because one, it wasn't what we needed it to be sales wise. And two, we wanted to focus on other areas of the business. But the biggest thing we learned about that, and again, this is being totally honest, is if we hadn't have done that, we wouldn't have gone, right, let's close, let's close that and focus on things that potentially are more profitable for us and that have got a bigger area of growth, which is retail. So we wouldn't be sat here now with a retail business that's gone into Waitrose, Co-op, Tesco's, Ocado and Sainsbury's across 15 different lines. Uh, and that's something I'm really, really proud of um, as, our, uh, you know, as a brand. So I think, you know, it, it all happens for a reason. That, that's one of the things I was, you said about investment there. I was going to ask you about, you know, in terms of raising finance. Um, yeah. Did you just kind of do that y yourself internally or did you well, get support help on that side? The thing is, Mike, we weren't all paid the same salary as you, so some of us had to, like, graft our nuts off. I was playing for the love of the game, mate. Nah, you weren't. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I think, um, yeah, so, you know, with us, we went, we've got investment from HSBC, uh, put together a decent plan, um, got a good relationship with them, so a bit of investment from them, and also, you know, a bit of um, private investment from family and friends. Um, but it's, it's a, a very, very small group, a couple of people. So um, that means when you get to board meeting levels and, you know, strategic decision making, you, you've got a group of people that are not just financially invested, but emotionally invested as well. Uh, and that makes a big difference. So if any of you go, uh, you know, I can get, deciding what sort of investment you get is really important, really, really yeah. important. It needs loads of time and research because, um, if you get that bit wrong, I think it can be a real, real barrier for growth. But if you get it right, I think equally you've got a bed where you can grow, um, grow from having the right people that are invested emotionally as well. Yeah, and just in terms of setting up your own business while you were playing, was there any kind of was it just kind of experience in terms of you you set up the business, you are running the business whilst you're playing? Was there any kind of course you did whilst you're playing in terms of, you know helping you? with setting up your own business or like when I, I said we had Tim Visser on last week talking about property development and he was saying you know obviously it's important to have qualifications have a degree that's great but you know experience is as important as having a qualification um yeah. and that seems to be more so the case going forward you know experience recruiters especially looking for not only qualifications but you know more so experience nowadays is would you agree with that yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I didn't do particularly well on my GCSEs or A-levels and then I didn't go yeah. to uni. So like, um, and then I didn't, I, you know, I didn't do any courses. I did a few cookery courses, um, but I, yeah, my big thing was experience and network. And I spent a lot of time, I, I know I've already said it, but I spent a lot of time networking. And then the biggest break for me was when I went to the RPA and said, you know, this is what I've been doing. Um, I've got me and my brother, it's called the Jolly Cog. Um, we cook bacon, we make sausages, you know, this is where we want to be long term. Um, do, you, do you think you could open up some doors? And then, you know, then that, that conversation started happening. And then some of the doors were pretty big. Some of them were yeah. like, yeah, go and do that. And, and it felt really uncomfortable. There was times where I go into a meeting in central London uh, and they go, well, you know, why are you here? And I'd be like, well, I'm Ollie and I'm from Harlequins and I love sausages and this is my I dream. Love, I love sucking malls, I love sausages and I love bacon. <laughs> um, this is my dream and um, this is where I want to get to. Um, and, you know, so some of it, you know, I didn't speak the same language as the retailers. There's a whole language to learn and there's some bits where I would have just looked stupid, but I wasn't afraid to look stupid and, and crack on. And, and it, the big thing for me was chucking myself into those some of them were, you know, uncomfortable conversations, but definitely one thing it's, it's stood me in good stead because um, if you do ever need to negotiate with retailers, um, most of the conversations are uncomfortable because um, you're always getting squeezed on margin wherever you look. So, um, yeah, I've just been, I've just spent the last two hours talking about pigs in blankets at Christmas. So um, that's been an interesting one. Yeah. And uh, you, you mentioned networking there, like, 
I feel kind of the lads get sick of me talking about, you know, I, I'm often talking about, you know, how powerful at all LinkedIn is in terms of connecting with people while you're playing, connecting with businesses, uh, you know, sponsors, whenever you're doing a networking event, corporate boxes you're visiting. I didn't really see it till I was about 30. Um, but in all honesty, isn't it important in terms of connecting with people, you know, building up a network of contacts whilst you're playing, which, you know, you can leverage after rugby. Well, it might not be straight away. It might be in 10, 15 years. But, you know, you've got that network of contacts stored in kind of a database that you can always go back to and, and contact. And, you know, you've kind of got a rapport and a relationship with them. Um, you know, I suppose that's been hugely, well, you've said it has, it's been hugely important for you going forward with, uh, setting up the business, hasn't it? Mate, it's been pinnacle. I reckon every single new bit of business we've won over the last 10 years, you could put back to, to rugby. And so I remember um, when we just had a concessions business, um, we, um, we we really wanted to grow the business. And I remember going to one of those really painful sponsors, black tie dinners for Quinn's. And yeah. um, I was sat next to this guy, and I, he was like, "What do you do?" I was like, oh, "I play rugby." He was like, "Oh yeah, you can never tell." Blah, blah, blah. And um, and then um, he, and I was like, "But I've just started a sausage business." Uh, and I was like, "So," and I said, "What do you do?" He's like, "Oh well, I own Winter Wonderland." I was like, "Ching," um, and uh, and he was like, "You know, do, you know, you should come and sell your sausages down here." And um, I'll never forget it because I went. I walked down to Hyde Park, and I don't know if you guys have been to Winter Wonderland before, but it, it turns over like 100 million quid in six weeks. It's ginormous. It's a beast of an event. And um, I went down there. I took my youngest in a buggy down there. It was rammed. I met him in his office the week after meeting him initially. Um, and, uh, the, you know, we put a, a, a log cabin in the middle of Winter Wonderland the year after. And that that single six weeks of trade, which was like 42 days of trade over Christmas, selling sausages and cones of crackling, doubled our turnover for the whole year. Um, and we then went two cabins the year after, three, four, I think we got up to five. We, I think we went back down to two. But we, you know, it started becoming mega for us. Um, and yeah, there's just, I think the point is, is there's just a massive network out there. And, and most of them, are willing to help rugby players. It's a lot easier um, when you're playing rugby because they all want to have a chat with you, so it's just easier. Yeah, and I suppose building that rapport and relationship with them while you're playing makes it a lot easier to leverage after rugby. Um, right. But yeah, mate, just, just one more from me and then we'll open up to the lads if they've got any questions because that's been half an hour now. Just when we spoke on the phone the other day, you mentioned jolly good deeds. So I think the message from that was it's you know about having a business with a purpose. I, I know you've done uh 20 20 000 plus uh meals for frontline workers which you do uh i think on a on a friday you've done that over the last 10 weeks just tell us a bit about that and i suppose what the message was in terms of having a business with a with a purpose or a message wow karen you've really done your research mate i was taking notes when we were talking so yeah you know yeah, yeah. um uh yeah so i think uh i think what we've learned over this um time which has been bonkers is that um uh, business with purpose um, has got real value, not just um, in terms of um, moral value for the, for you or your family who are in it, but actual value commercially. So um, obviously, you know, Tom's is a really good example, the shoe company, but um, we've definitely learned that over the last couple of months. Um, yeah, we were effectively sat on loads of stock from not being able to go to Glastonbury, all these events, and then closing down the restaurant. So we took um, a load of bacon down to our local NHS hospital, Southmead, which is, I think, the biggest in the Southwest. And they've got 5,000 odd doctors and nurses. And um, yeah, so it started off you know, taking Miss Piggy down and giving them bacon sandwiches um, to support to support them in this crazy time. And then, yeah, we got to 20, nearly 21,000 last Friday. Um, and yeah, it's, it has been a really, really nice kind of humbling experience to be involved in. Um, we were then able to, you know, the first week we, we got quite a lot of traction. So we got donations and um, uh, some people financially donated to us and some people gave us, you know, one bakery gave us 20,000 rolls um, to dish out. So we had support. It wasn't just us, but um, yeah, we were on the ground delivering it and it was just great to be part of. We did it three times a week. Um, and what off the back of that, we're going to, we're going to do, um, we're going to do jolly good deeds every Friday. So, in some way we're going to spend our Friday mornings 
um, helping others. Um, and as I say, it's it's been great to be part of. So whether that is dishing out 100 Scotch eggs to a, a local school charity or um, going and cooking um, for people on a bigger scale, um, it will kind of vary, I think, in, in scale. But um, we're going to do something every Friday. I, and I think that adds real value. So any of you setting up a business or thinking about um, your business, that is something that is extremely tra attractive to um, customers and investors, um, you know, business with purpose. Um, and we were lucky, we were in a position where we could actually make a big impact. So we could go down there. It wasn't just money we were chucking into a trust. It was um, actual bacon sandwiches. And the delight on someone's face, if you get give them a free bacon sandwich, when they've done a 12 hour shift in a COVID ward, um, yeah. it was pretty amazing. So yeah, it's good to be part of. Great stuff. Uh, lads, listen, that's 35 minutes. I don't want to keep this too long, but uh, just, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in. Is that, if anyone's got a question, um, please just unmute yourself and ask away. Yeah, I've anyone? got a good one, lads, if yeah. you, if you can. Um, so I'm, pretty similar to what sounds like the start of your journey. Um, I've got a pizza business. We're basically doing small scale events, um, festivals, weddings, stuff like that. At the moment, we're looking to expand. Um, but I'm just curious, at what point with you, because at the moment, it's just me and my brother. Um, at what point did you start hiring external people, external staff in to sort of spread that workload? I think I'm a bit of a control freak, and a bit of a perfectionist when it comes to it. So I'm, I'm struggling to, to get over that hurdle at the moment. Yeah, well, I think the interesting thing about concessions and the events business is that to scale it up is actually really difficult because, it, you know, there's me, Max and Josh, so we could probably do an event each at any one time if it worked out. So that would be three events on a Saturday or whatever at the same time if we had enough units. Um, but yeah, you know, and then eventually we, we took on supervisors and we grew. Um, and at one point we had like like 40 people running around the stoop or different events. Um, um, some of them were supervisors running events on their own. Um, but yeah, the, the problem is, is, is as soon as you, um, as you can imagine, allow someone else to run a unit for you and there's a big queue and you're trying to bash portions out to make money and you've got a small window, um, quality can go down. Um, and I think that's, that's, um, that's just something to bear in mind because actually, um, you know, quality is paramount in that business. Um, so yeah, it, I think the answer is it's really difficult to scale up. You know, if you want ten pizza wagons or ten kiosks, um, you need a very very simple operation whereby quality um, you take you take out human error um, out of it. And even you know, cooking a sausage and putting that in a finger roll um, with some onions um, can be very different depending on who's doing it and if ultimately someone's getting paid seven fifty eight pound an hour to work at a stadium to bash out. They don't really care. Um, they're not gonna care like you and your brother. So um, it's a tricky one. It takes time, I guess. Sweet, thank you. Lads, um, anyone? Oh, sorry, yeah. go on. Sorry. Uh, Oliver, we've spoken before. Uh, for me, um, I said, that obviously, I'm into barbecue and then it's a hobby. And then I was barbecuing for my mates. And then from that, what happened was people were messaging me because I had an Instagram account opened up asking me to do barbecues for them. And then obviously rugby started and the Saturdays I was busy, but obviously it wasn't fully set up business, um, but obviously I, can't, I couldn't trust anyone to go do the work for me. So yeah. how would I go about that hurdle then? Is that, is that a federal, I had to cancel obviously people who wanted orders from me. So how would I do that? How would I get over that hurdle? What do you do for a second with Quinns? Yeah, I guess like, um, so <laughs> we, obviously rugby is, is is more important at this stage for you um for me I, I have my brother so i could work with him on the business and then he delivered it whether it be a private hog roast or um at sarries or quinn's or wherever we were so i had a business partner which enabled us to well we were on the same page obviously we trusted each other um, and in a cash business then that makes a big difference as well um, and i trusted that he would deliver the quality we want so um but it's not always easy finding a business partner um but uh, it's a difficult one i think you know if ultimately you're going to be committed to playing rugby every saturday then great but you know if if you have three months over the summer um and you can do pre-season and you can balance it and you can get some saturdays barbecue booked in 
then it'd be pretty good to look back when the season kicks off in September and you've done eight private events, barbecue-wise, um, on your Saturdays when you are available. If, if your club doesn't train on a Saturday, then that's a step, definitely a step in the right direction. Then quickly your network will open up and you might find you know, another person who you can partner with who can take it on. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I understand. Yeah, I understand. But it, is, it would be difficult to scale up because it, it would... Um, like yeah. what size you want it to be. Yeah, I've pretty much done that the whole summer because I was pretty much booked up the whole summer and then September came and then season started and then I had to, people were pre-booking me and I had to, well, so basically so I can't do it because obviously they're expecting me to be there. I am the product because that's the way I see it. Yeah. Me being there as a rugby player, they want that and obviously the food as well. So it was difficult to get, let's say, my cousin or someone who even I know can do a job but you still can't trust them to do it the same as you because the people expect you to be there and speak to them as well at the same time, if that kind of makes sense. Um, it, it, it totally makes sense. And that's where, you know, it's kind of, it's very similar to us. Like people wanted to come to the Jolly Hog to eat the sausage, sausages that me and Josh had made and us to be there. But we had ambitions to grow the brand. That's why we wanted to get into retail because, um, you know, our faces might be on the back of the pack, but, you know, we, we're not there. Um, and it's, it's scalable. And that's why we got into other channels because um, eventually you need a business that's scalable and it's going to pay you good money. Well, cheers. Cheers for that. Cheers, mate. Lads, any, any more questions? Connor, I think you're asking, sorry, you're on mute there, mate. Just unmute yourself. Good man. Yeah, cheers, Mike. Um, <laughs> thanks very much for that, Ollie. It was really, 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 really good. Just with... Um, Obviously, you've got your concessions for the stadiums and that at the start, that made up a big part of your business. How popular, how many like private bookings were you doing for, I don't know, like weddings, birthday parties? Was that a big part of the business? And was, how did you go about selling it? Was it just people approaching you on match day going, I'd love you to do that? Or did you do some strategy around the market? Um, so we, so pri the private work was actually pretty big for us at the start. Um, and uh, I think anyone that's setting up a catering business, you could pick up quite a lot of private work quite quickly um, through Facebook ads, um, through word of mouth, you know, through a bit of networking. You know, we went to, um, uh, it's funny now, but we went to wedding fairs. Um, so we did quite a lot of weddings. You know, Hog Race was really popular and it still is because it's quite an economical way of um, feeding lots of people. Um, so um, yeah, we did some, we did some expos, um, but actually because, because we had the um, uh, awareness from the stadiums and because we had a bit of a profile, people, people, you know, I remember getting really, really excited. We used to have a lot of inquiries about weddings come through the website. Um, and um, yeah, and we were good value. So it kind of worked out for people. Um, it, eventually we got to a point where um, we stopped the private catering because it didn't stack up. I mean, unless you're, unless you're doing quite a high spend per head, it's, it's, a, it's a ball lake. Uh, and there's quite a lot of regional people that could potentially do it cheaper price per head. Um, but going out there, you know, we got quite a lot of inquiries from the stadium stuff and then um, and from Facebook and things like that. And um, how many how many vendors do you have now? And do, do you own all of them or do you, do you lease them? What's the best bet with doing that kind of stuff? So, uh, as in, when do you mean, like sites? Like, no, more like, um, like, let's say, the vans you use to, to push out the product. Yeah, so we, like we, I mean, if you came in now, you'd be like, Jesus Christ, it's like we've got so many different uh, units. Like, we started off with Miss Piggy, well, we started off with a tent and a barbecue, that was it. Um, and we still got a lot of pop up events because we uh, pop up units because we did uh, Tough Mudder for four years. So we, we built all of the external catering for Tough Mudder. Um, so a lot of that was kind of build up scaff poles, canvases, tents. Um, but in terms of other other units we we i remember when we bought um miss piggy which is our big kind of airstream silver trailer um and um we, it cost us 30 grand and i was like i and we we towed it from the person who built it straight to rosalind park sevens uh, and i just remember ourselves because it was 30 grand it was a mega investment for us at the time but we've literally used miss piggy every single weekend for the last seven or eight years i mean she's been hammered like hammered. and so it's been a good a good investment because it's a nice looking unit it's kind of um it's timeless really into in the way it looks 
the way the way units look is really important for different um, festivals and stadia. Um, but yeah, uh, to answer your question, we've probably got six different, uh, five different trailers, which would be trailers, HY vans, you know, the little vintage trucks. Um, uh, and then we've got built-in kiosk at Ashton Gate. We've got um, three cabins at the Stoop. Um, we've got a kiosk at Bath Spa. Um, yeah, we, we actually built quite a lot of log, like wooden cabins as well at different venues, which is kind of semi-permanent things as well. So lots of different setups but you know if there's any advice you want on different trailers or setups or vans let me know because we've made loads of mistakes on that front brilliant all right cheers thanks very much yes. lads any any last questions no all good lads uh we'll wrap it up just um ollie thanks very much for your time really appreciative of uh you great to hear your story mate and hear, hear how well you're doing um so lads uh, thanks very much mate and um uh, can the lads probably connect with you on LinkedIn if they've got any questions and uh, yeah, reach yeah. out to you that way? Yeah, or drop my yeah. an email and get my email. I'm happy to have a chat outside of this. If there's anything I can Perfect. help with, more than happy. Uh, lots of people have helped me along the way, <laughs> um, so I'm more than happy to pass that on. Sweet. Lads, just ne next week we might have, um, we're hopefully going to have personal training. Guys who set up a business in personal training, so Mel Dean and Ben Gotting, hopefully. So uh, it might be... The opposite. Hey? The opposite to me then well different completely different industry yeah we, you might join us as well i will we could do one with you on sacking malls as well <laughs> so, uh, lads here ollie thanks very much lads thank you very much for joining uh enjoy the rest of the day appreciate it boys thank you cheers cheers lads